Hi, everyone. The clicker doesn't work. Fun for me. Uh, so, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm Alex. I'm uh, from a company called Speed Data. We're developing the, big, the next big thing in uh, big data. We're developing a new accelerator and a new general purpose CPU. And at my work, I get to play a lot with C++, with the newer stuff, with the older stuff, but basically with the newer stuff, with templates and such. And uh, I want to say one thing to you all today. Thank you for coming, but you're a bunch of masochists. Because this, this talk is going to hurt you much more than it's going to hurt me. So uh, with that being said, let's start. Because I don't. I'll be sure to work with you. So, sorry? I'll be sure to work for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so without further ado, let's start. Nothing works. Okay, so what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear template metaprogramming, the big boogeyman? Anyone wants to tell me? Functional programming. Oh, that's nice. Complicated. Complicated? Yeah. That's nice as well. What else? Coding what? Coding header. Coding header, yeah. But what do you feel when you see metaprogramming? What do you feel when you see those templates? Those horrible, horrible templates. Is it critical to use it? Okay. Strange errors. Strange and horrible errors. Thank you. Yeah, that happens a lot. What else? Anyone else? But that's basically it. And this clicker doesn't work as well. <laughs> Might be. I will try another USB. I will try another USB. Excuse me for this. No, it doesn't work. Never mind. We'll handle it like that. So, for most people, that's what they think when they see that. Usually when people see those metaprogramming templates headers and they see those templates, those horrible, horrible things that will haunt you at night, this is the reaction that you will get from most people. So don't worry. I said it will hurt you, but like in a good exercise, we will start with some stretch. Oh, we will start with some stretches, but with basic template rules, but don't forget there's nothing basic about templates. So even the stretch is going to be really, really hard. Look at that guy there. So we will start with something really simple. And then we will gradually go up with what we're going to see here in the, in the talk. We will start with functional metaprogramming. We will start with function templates. So what can you do with function templates? You can specialize them. You can overload them. You can do both, but you cannot sp uh, partially specialize them. What do I mean by that? This piece of code is fine. So you have two functions that do print here. You are wrapping it. One is a template function that just receives a template parameter, t, and then you print it. Another one is a full specialization. What you say here is basically, I don't care. This function is a full specialization just for ints. So if the, temp, if the overloading method will come in here, it will pick the correct function. Uh, and basically what will be printed here for the first one, it will be printed one with T. And on the other one, on the other hand, it will print the int one. That's exactly what you wanted to see. But the partial specialization is not allowed. So you cannot just say, Let's have a print function with a template and another print function with a template. And that template is only for pointers. That doesn't work. Gla uh, simply enough, the compiler gives you a nice error in this case. And it says that's in Clang. Most of the things that we will see here it's in, are in Clang. And uh, it's nice. It's telling you partial specialization is not allowed. That's clear. So we will not do it. Uh, Function templates. But they, what can we do? They can be overloaded. 
And basically, you should do that. You should overload and not specialize. So you can see here that you have the same, two, the same templates, and each function is templated, and those functions are fully are overloaded for the pointer. So in this case, this is fine. This will print whatever you think it will print. In this case, we have i that is 1. The print function that receives the pointer will go to the pointer function. The, the, the print i itself will go to the i function. And every, everything will be fine and dandy. Everything is fine here. Please, 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 one thing I want you to not forget from this talk is don't overload and specialize. It causes horrible things that you cannot imagine. And sometimes it breaks logic. So let's go to an example of how it breaks our logic. Look at this code example. This is a very, very famous code example about templates. What's going on here? We have three template functions, three print functions. The first one is just the base template that prints generic. The second one is an overload of that function that, print, uh, that prints overload. And this is only for, uh, only for pointers. The third one is the full specialization of the pointer function for double pointers. And it will print specialization. Here we are creating a double, 1.5, and printing the, uh, printing the pointer for double. What do you think will be printed? Specialization? You are correct. Here it's specialization. But let's look at this one. It's the same code. The only thing that changed here, that the specialization went up to line 36. What will happen here? That's right. Overload will be printed here. So it's a fiasco. Basically, why it happens? You just changed the place? I just changed the place of the function. That's it. In the code, yeah, yeah, you can see here. The specialization is in line 36 now. Beforehand, you could see that specialization is in line 38. That's the only change in the code. But the outcome is totally different. And that's because of ODR. So basically what happens here, overloads look only at base functions. And they don't care about the specialization. So where you place the specialization is very, very important. If you place it in an incorrect place, it will just be ignored. And it will pick the more specialized one, which is not correct. But for him, it's the right thing to do. For the compiler, I mean. So don't do it. Just don't do it. Just overload. Uh, another quick look at class, class templates. We can do everything with class templates. We can uh, specialize them. We can uh, partially specialize them. So now we have more that is uh, here. We have more that is a regular template struct. Here we have a partially uh, specialized template more for T pointer, only for T pointers. And we have one that is fully specialized. And we can do everything with them. Everything is fine. There's a lot more to say about template classes. But we don't have time for that, so let's continue. Now, we stretch a little bit and we got to something that actually will be usable during this talk. Let's start with Trait Library. Trait Library was a library that was added in C11 to the standard. And you could create many constraints to your templates with this library. Basically, you got many, many useful things inside it. You have much more. Just go to uh, type traits.h and you will see all the traits that you have here. Um, for example, you could say, I want to do something only with pointers, or I want to do something only if it's an abstract class. Or you could check if t and u are the same type. So this is very, very useful. And we will use a lot of that during the talk. How will we use it? We will constrain our template types with the type trait system, and then we will get to, con uh, to concepts. So let's start with the first one. Let's look at this function. Will it always work? It's a simple print function that takes a constant t reference and prints it. What might go wrong? Well, 
Uh, okay, that will not happen because stream can be a constant, and that's fine. T is not printable, or um, something very, very simple. What will happen if I'll pass a pointer here? So you cannot print a pointer in this case. But the function wants to take any T type that it finds. So we have a problem. We need to do something with it. We cannot just create one template function and say, it's generic for everyone, it will work all the time. It will not. And you will get this. Uh, because I'm using FMT during this talk, it's a very nice new library, and its errors are very nice and clear as well. So it's uh, just saying, hey man, you pushed a pointer here, but it's not a void pointer, so I cannot print it. So do something with it. Um, OK, so what can we do with that? We can do our first fix for that problem with type traits. There are many, many more possible fixes for this, but let's look at this one. Uh, we will create a base template class that will, call, will be called print helper. Print helper will be templated on T and a bool. A bool is a non-template type. And inside it, it will have a static void pointer function that's called print, and it takes the T const uh, reference that we wanted. We will need to create another template class that is partially specialized, and we will say here it is still templated on T, but it will take T and always true. Only when you will pass something that is true, this, uh, this class will be instantiated. Sorry. And it has the same static void print, but in this case, I know it's a pointer, and I will do the reference it, and I will print it. How do we use it? Inside, we will create another function that's called print. Print is templated on T only. It will get the T const reference that we want. And then we will instantiate the print helper class with T that we want to print. And we will use our type traits. So is uh, std is pointer T value print T. Hard to write, basically for the library developer. Um, easier to use. But this is one of the things that we had to do before we had concepts and other nicer things in C17 that we will, got, we will get to there in a minute. Here we can make it. Why not use is pointer T? Ah, okay. There's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. No, uh, that's an excellent question. That's an excellent question. You're right. So why not to use something that uh, was introduced? Sorry? No, that's from, uh, that's from 14. Is pointer V is from 14. The the oh, sorry. So yeah, I'm sorry. So we could fix it with, uh, with this. We just, they have. Uh, oh, you drew me off my talk. Sorry. <laughs> One minute. So you could use those subtype V or subtype T. It's something that uh, the standard defined inside the trait library. It says just basically it, it's a using. It's not a using. It's a templated Boolean const expression that says that we want something that is the value of is pointer V, and it will be true or false and it will always tell us how to do it. So basically, it's the same, but it's less code to write. Another way we can do it is by using type dispatch. So let's think about that. Is pointer t type is always true type or false type? So we can use it for our advantage. Basically, those things will be, uh, will be our uh, tags. Instead of writing classes and functions inside the classes, we can just do with a function right now. So we are templating the function that's called print helper, and we will pass std false type here with the t const reference, and we will print it. If we will get this, uh, then we will define the same function with std true type, it's our tag. When we will be passed std true type, we know that it's a pointer and then we will just dereference it. 
How do we use it? The same way. We have a function that gets only the tconst reference that we wanted to print. And then we are pushing std is pointer type and we instantiating it and pushing the t inside, printing it. It's a little bit cleaner, not too much. They are not pointers. Raw pointers. Okay. Yeah. Um, with C plus plus seventeen, we could go, we could get even cleaner code. So here, in this case, all we need to do is to pr to create one function that's called print. That's all we wanted to do, anyways. That gets the tconst reference here. And use if const expression. If you don't know what if const expression is, it's basically telling the compiler, I just want one of these branches to be in the code. If you are not using one of the branches, please remove it. So we can do whatever we want, and it will take only the right thing here. And uh, basically, we are still using this pointer v, t, and we are using the same fmt prints. And the compiler will do the work for us. Getting cleaner, right? With C++20, we can use our first concept. This is the first and most basic concept that we will see here. And this concept is a parameter to a function, an auto parameter to a function. So in this case, I can create two small functions. One is for reference, one is for pointer. And we just know because it's a reference or a pointer. Clean, understandable, almost like tag dispatch, but much less code and much cleaner. I wish. I wish. It cannot. How about the universal reference? The universal reference? Uh, if it will be a universal reference, it will be OK. But then it will take the Yeah. Still, some things that you need to think about, but uh, it's much cleaner. But you need to get uh, appointed and understand what you're doing when you're writing autos inside a function. Void pointer is a pointer. You cannot dereference it. You, you're right. It's a toy example. So you need to watch out for void pointers. And basically, you have a trait that's uh, a type trait that's called is void. So you need to ask for is it a void, and then just not do anything with it. Uh, okay. So now that we know that we can constrain our types, we can get to business and actually create our con uh, container detection. What we want to do here is basically, we want to detect a container. A container is all the, con uh, all the data types that contain multiple data inside them that you know from C++. For example, vector is a container, map is a container, whatever else you can think about is a container. So how can we do it? Uh, for a naive way, we, we might say that, OK, Every container has a nested iterator type inside them. Let's use that, right? A good idea. So how will we implement that? It should look something similar to what we already seen. It will be a struct with std uh, static const bool value. But how we will implement it, we will see in a second. To understand how to implement something like that, we need to understand a very important principle in C++ that's called sfine. A funny name for a very important thing. So Sfine is ba basically saying substitution failure is not an error. In the template overload world, what happens is if you have an error in an overload when, you type the the, when you're trying to type deduct something and you have another overload to work with, just be quiet about it and use the correct function. So we will use a lot of that. And it's really important to understand this principle because it's really was was really important for for a, a template metaprogramming. But as we progressed, it became easier and easier. So how will we use it? To use it, we need to understand another very important principle about ellipsis. Ellipsis is basically a C thing that says we can get as much parameter as we want. A very important thing to understand about the overload resolution is that ellipsis functions were inferior to all other functions. So 
it will be always the less specialized one and it will be less used. So in this case, the first function that is, uh, uh, that is defined here is with ellipses and it will print ellipses. The second function is for ints and it will print an integer. So and uh, here we are calling 17 with an integer and then with a, with a string. Basically does what, uh, what we thought it will do. The overload resolution works fine. So integer is picked for integers and ellipses is picked for when we are using a string and we don't know what to do with it. Let's do an even implementation of our detecting a container. So we have a, a struct is container that is templated on some type name t and then we have another template function that's called f with ellipses and it's templated on s and it will return byte just for size. Then we have the same f function that returns size t that will receive iterator an iterator from the struct that we received here, the template struct that we received here, pointer to this iterator. Uh, basically, we will use a sphene here, here, in this line. We will need to create a static const bool value. This static const bool value will be uh, true if the size of what will be returned from f, when passed a zero to it, zero might be a pointer, and all pointer is a zero is equal to size t. If it's equal to size t, it's a container. If it's not equal to size t, it's not a container, it will be false. That's how we detect it. That was the first and naive way to do that. Now that we, now that we implemented it, how can we use it? Can we use it like that? So no, we cannot use it like that because uh, until C++17, it wasn't a good idea. We didn't use const expression here, if const expression. I wanted to show you a gradual way of how we will progress with things. So we will do some other things until we will get to C++17 again. So what can we do? All the things that we already saw. We can delegate to a helper class, we can delegate to a helper function, or in some cases it's just suitable to write two small functions and let the compiler do the work for you. To do that, we will need to understand enable if. Enable if is something that we got in the standard library that helps uh, the compiler to select the, the sfine function that we want, to select the correct function. This is its implementation. You can go look at it uh, after, the, uh, after the talk. How do we use it? This is the actual usage of it, and we can see if it's a container or not. So we are creating a template function that's called print that gets our type, the t reference type. We have std enable if t. It's the uh, inner definition of the type that it will get. It will get our is container v that was defined in the previous slides with the t that we define. If it's a container, then it will be true. If it's not a container, then it will be false, and void, uh, void pointer will be selected, and it will always be null. In this case, we will print it as a regular thing. It will be just a regular type, and we need, don't need to dereference it. On the other hand, the same enable if, almost the same thing. We will just ask, is it a container? If it is a container, it still will be a void pointer. It will still get a null, but we know that we need to print it here. So basically, this code will produce what we wanted. It will produce 18 because it's not a container, and then it will print 1, 2, 3 because it's the container that we created here. Uh, with C17, our implementation got clearer. We don't need to use enable if. We're using if const expression. We are doing the same thing. Just with if const expression, we are removing the branches that are not needed, and we are still printing. What we, what we thought will be printed. It compiles. All these code snippets, by the way, are compiling fine. Void t. Sometimes when you're using enable if, it's really hard to use it. And uh, to do more or more understanding of how to do that, we should use an IDM that was invented by uh, Walter E. Brown, that uh, was a keynote, or spe a keynote speaker here. 
Um, basically, this IDM says that if void T is um, sorry is uh, well formed, if void T is well formed, only if T is well formed. So it's easier to write it, less code, more understandable, and you don't need to use all that uh, black magic with uh, with enable if. This is the implementation that will be used for void T. Basically, it's a void, and uh, it's using a void T, and it will be uh, well formed only if all those classes that will be received will be well formed. And that's already in C++ 17, and you can just use it with std uh, void T, and thank you, Walter E, for creating that. Now, let's get to the main event, and uh, let's create uh, our first concept. We basically already saw some kinds of concept. We already talked about the concept, uh, some of them. The most naive one was the is container. The out of our function is a concept as well, as I mentioned. But let's create something that is more evolved. Uh, basically, the is container is, was very, very naive. And to understand what container are in C++, they must obey or abide all these six rules. So each container type in C++ has to have a std begin that returns a begin iterator, std end that returns an add iterator, begin iterator, t and tail iterator that are comparable with not equal, uh, begin iter has plus plus, and the begin has a dereference, uh, dereference operator which is not void, and begin iter and tail iter are copy constructible and destructible. Let's create this thing. To create them, we need helper templates. So we need to create our helper templates. And here we will have the tbegin template. The tbegin template just says, OK, what is the type? If I will get this C to the template, what is the, st what is the std begin of the decalval of C? Decalval is a function that was uh, provided to us in C11 that creates, uh, creates any type, even if it's not uh, default constructible. So here we are constructing something that is not default constructible, and it does it for us just to see if the compiler can cr uh, has this type of function. So the tbegin is basically what will be the type if we can use stdbegin on this C type object. T end is almost the same, but it's for std end. Uh, T not equalable. <laughs> it's a, it needs to receive begin iterator. In end iterator, what it does is says, OK, let's decalval the bi, let's decalval the ei, and let's see if, there, if we can't use the not equal operator on them. And what the type will be returned. The type will be, uh, that should be returned here is a Boolean. Boolean expression. Uh, we need to continue. We need to see if uh, they can be increasable. So we are defining the, the bi as a decalval again, and we are using the increase operator plus plus here. And we are seeing what the type will be here. Then we are saying, OK, they need to be dereferenceable as well. So we are using decal type here as well for bi, saying what the type for it, and using it. Last and not least, let's create our std is contain. Uh, let's create our struct is container from what we need here. So, what we created before. So, std is container is a, a template that received the C, the container type itself, and a type name void. Anything that can be here, we just need the void as a default param a template parameter. Is container is a, a is a inheriting from std false type because we wanted to have the t type and the value inside it so we can just inherit from false type and why we're inheriting here from false type it's because we are saying if something happens here then it's not a container that is the base template afterwards when we actually need to create it we need to write all this down so here we have a, sp a partial specialization of that function uh, of that uh, struct that says that is container C and we are using std void type that we learned about it before. We are saying, okay, we are passing to the void type. We are passing t begin with C, t end, 
t in, uh, increasable with t begin c, t not, uh, in, uh, t not equal with t begin and t end, t dereferable with t begin c, std int integral constant with boolean and convertible v, t increasable, t begin, t end, and you can imagine it continues and continues. This code is horrible. It's really, really horrible. It's not maintainable. And the things that you will see from the compiler that it throws from you if you're making a mistake here, horrifying. <laughs> so let's look at the examples. After writing this monstrosity, using it is pretty simple. All we need to do is to create a const expression function that says is container, receive a const uh, c container inside it, and returns is container c value. Pretty easy, right? We can use it with enable if, and uh, in this example I have used enable if as a return type, and basically the compiler will look at the return type, and uh, sfini will kick in on the correct function, and it will use uh, true or false, and it will actually create the correct thing and will throw the other one away. Um, problems, anyone? It's hard to develop a new concept. It's really hard. If you want something simple, it's still hard. If you want something complex, you just saw something that is complex-ish, but you can have things that are more complex than that. Error messages are horrible, horrifying. You don't want to see them. Enable if and void t aren't readable to many, per, uh, to many users, so it's not maintainable. You have to explain to each one, uh, to each person that looks at that. And from my experience and my work, when I used to write those things, people did, didn't want to touch my code at all. So uh, that's understandable. Void t is a, a way to, to see if something is well formed. So void t will be a well formed void only if all the template parameters that it receives will be well formed. It, it basically, it's really, really close to enable if, but without all the gibberish and the extra code that needs to be written there. It's easier to read, it's easier to maintain, it's still horrible. And most people cannot read it. They really can't. So it makes them cry, it makes them run away. Now let's go to C++, where it was all our lives. People that wrote in uh, meta programming in C++, it really made our life easier, C++ concept. And again, guys, concepts were created by Walter E. Brown. So thank you again. Uh, with C++ 20, it will be much, much easier for us to create concepts, to maintain concepts and to understand the errors that we will get from them. So here we will start with an example of a very simple concept that we will use later. Not equable. Here you can see the first example of a new concept from the C++ library. We are saying it's still templated on BI and EI. Concept, not function, not struct. We need to say it's a concept. Then we will have a require expression. And here we are creating something that is not there. Basically, instead of writing decal val, decal type, and all those things, all we need to do is to say bi, bi, ei, ei, and it will create something for us. It will do it behind the scenes. Here is an example of the expression itself. So here we are saying, if bi is not equal to ei, and the concept will fail if they are not equal, and then this uh, trailing return, it says, if the type that is returned from this expression is not convertible to bool, fail as well. So we're killing two birds with one stone here. We're saying, are those types not equal? And are they convertible to bool? Maybe a better way to write it will be same as, because convertible to bool, it might be an integer, but nevertheless. How do we use it? We create a template function, a const expression function, that has bi, that is the begin iterator, then we're saying not equable bi ei. Basically saying, I want to use the type that, will be g that we will receive here and compare it with bi. So we don't need to specify both types because the first type is always consumed 
from the parameter itself, from the type that is defined with the concept. And then we are creating the function that receives bi and ei and returns true. Basically, if they are not equable, it will return true. If not, we will see a nice error. So here is an example usage. Here we have a foo that receives int and long. They are comparable, they are, returning, uh, they are returning bool, everything will be fine here. But if we will try to do something like that, we will create an integer and then an std vector iterator, we will get those error messages. So those are pretty readable, don't you think? It says this function cannot be evaluated because this was evaluated to false. Why was it evaluated to false? Oh, because bi and ei would be invalid. Pretty readable, pretty understandable. We can use the same clause or expression in many ways. So first thing, I use it as a clause, uh, sorry, as an expression or as a type. Now I'm using it as a clause. So I'm telling here, I want to have a template with type name bi and type name ei, and I require the template to be not equable bi ei. And it will do the same job, but we are writing it differently. So it's a flavor thing. Sometimes it's better to write it like that. Sometimes you, uh, people will use it like I showed before. But it basically does the same thing. Yes? This? Yeah, that, that's what I said. It, it's not. No, no, I didn't say it evaluates them. I said we are killing two birds with one stone. Beforehand, I had to create a special type for BI, EI. Then I had to create a... Okay, are you not... Uh, um, if you are not uh, convertible, then I had to create a type for this thing and do a decal value on that as well. And then I had to say, is the uh, same as, and then, here I don't have to say that. I'm doing this, uh, three of those operations, uh, four operations at the same time. But they're not, uh, they're not, it's not instantiating something. It's not used. It's not real code. It's the, uh, during the compile time just to see that the constraint remains. Nothing more. Another way to use it is uh, to say it after a function. So basically, it's almost the same thing. We're declaring a function. We're passing bi and ei. And then we are saying this function requires not equal bi ei. And we will return true here. And another way to do it is with a concept from C++20. So we're saying this function will receive anything, auto. Uh, it must be not equal with bi auto ei. So we are constraining this auto always be not equal to bi itself. OK, so now we can continue implementing our is container clause. And we need, to remain, uh, we need to continue with all those things that we are created for the regular one with the templates. But here it will be much easier. So here we have not equal begin and end. We have a require ex expression that says we will get a C here. We will check if uh, C can, uh, can, if we can use std begin on C, if we can use std end on C, if they can be not equable, std begin and std end. And we will ask std uh, as same as bool. So again, we are doing a lot of the boilerplate and the horrible template code that we had to do before. Everything is done here in one line. Afterwards, we need to see if it's beginnable. Just use std begin. We need to see if it's std endable. We need to do std end. By the way, those things are not needed because they are checked here. I just wanted to be pedantic. That's it. Okay. <laughs> That's right. Oh, sorry. OK, now we need to see if it's incrementable. So still require close. We will get a C here. We will do std begin. 
and we will see that, uh, that we can increment whatever is returned from std begin c. Then we need to do if it's begin the refable. Again, very simple. We will get a C here. We will see if SD begin is derefable. But now we need to see if it's uh, not void. So we need to create begin derefable to void. And we will ask if it's not derefable to void here. So basically what we are doing is creating another expression inside it. We are saying STD begin C dereference. And if what's returned from this expression is the same as void, it will return true. Or basically the constraint will be, it will be satisfied. Uh, I need to check that. I don't remember. I just know it needs to have increment. I'm not sure about post or pre. Um, okay. And now we can create our uh, concept is container. So template type name C. Very simple. Concept container equals begin C and then end. Uh, end. Enable, uh, um, endable C and begin incredible C and begin the refable C and not equable and begins uh, not equal begin and end and not begin the refable to void begin and copy constructible destructible C. Pretty simple, pretty understandable. The code got much, much cleaner. You use less code. You don't need to create all these templates that we used before. We are doing this job in a very, very simple way and we're getting the same results. So here is an example of a, of a usage. So we can use it in a static assert. We can say cons, uh, container std vector int must be a container. Or we can create another function that is, uh, that is called is first element the same. So we are passing container out to C1. We are saying this auto can be only a container. It can be any type that, uh, that, that is satisfying the constraint from container. Then we have a container out to C2. Again, it can be only a container. Then we are asking if std begins C1 and std begins C2, the reference they are both, if they are the same. If they are not the same, it will return false. Pretty simple to use. We have vector and array, and we are using is first element the same, VA, everything works. Each one of those are basically containers. Why am I doing an implicit cast from bool to it? Good catch. I will fix it later. Thank you. That's Why correct. Just a preference. Nothing more. <laughs> you mean uh, dot begin? Yeah. Just a preference. I prefer to use std begin and std end everywhere because it's clearer. Because uh, if you will try to do something and it doesn't have it, but basically you always need to, to implement the function that does that. So the standard doesn't say dot begin needs to be there, but it says that std begin should return the first iterator. So say if someday we'll, they will implement a container that doesn't have the dot begin. begin, it will still be on the... Yeah. It will not happen, but still. It, it can happen to you as a cookie. It can happen to what? Oh. You, you can over, you can <coughs> modify it that the specific uh, instance of STD begin for, say, a built in array in, in, and have it register as a container, for example. Okay. Okay, that might happen. Thank you. Uh, and here is an error example. So we have the same function, is first element, is first element the same, still getting the same thing. And we have vector and tuple. Uh, vector and tuple, tuple is not a container, so it will not satisfy our thing, uh, satisfy our constraint, I'm sorry. And this is the error that you will receive from it. Basically, again, the error is readable. You can understand that this function cannot be satisfied. Why is this function cannot be satisfied? Because container is not satisfied. Why is container is not satisfied? Because begin, uh, beginnable is not satisfied. Why is beginnable is not satisfied? Because begin 
cannot be called on C. Clear. If it was a template, uh, if it was a template thing, you will get like two, three pages of error codes that say nothing, and you will chase ghosts for days, and you will find nothing. Then you will burn your computer, and you will pray to the Lord of Darkness. I don't know, and maybe you will find the code. <laughs> what? Move to us. <laughs> Uh, this is not a Rust talk, but they have something else that's called um, the thing that, uh, is, uh, that is forbidden in C++. Um, Null pointer sign? Uh, that's as well, uh, but uh, the thing with, um, with the asterisk, not the asterisk. Uh, never mind. I will, remi <laughs> I will remember later. It's, it's like what the precompiler does. Uh, hashtag, but uh, it's called macros. Thank you. <laughs> macros are forbidden. Uh, macros in Rust are generics. Uh, OK, so conclusion. In conclusion, concepts simplify the code. They are clearing our, uh, they, uh, they are clearing our mistakes. You can mistake, uh, your mistake can be easily cleared. Can easily fi you can easily fix your mistakes. People can use it. People can write it. People can actually do metaprogramming without cursing all the time. Um, and as I said, sorry? And as I said, we will make compiler e e errors easier. So if something happens and you have these con uh, concepts in your code, you will still get a clear error message and nothing will be that hard to understand. Debugging time will be much, much easier and less time spending on things you don't understand. So here is an example of what it looked like with templates. And I didn't include all the things that we did to get here. There's tons of code beforehand. And this is the concept. Clear, easy, understandable, readable. And even our machine thinks it's 83% readable. That's fine. It's still template metaprogramming, but it's much, much better now. So. Thank you very much. And questions? I have a question. Yeah. Essentially, we don't need the, when we have concepts, we don't need templates No, no, you do need it. You do need it. Look, every time that you use it, you need, cons uh, you need templates. So here, it's not template. I'm just using auto concept here instead of template. But beforehand, I did have a function that used templates, or haven't I? I will need to edit. Here. So basically, we are defined the not equal uh, concept, and we are constraining the template types. We're saying bi and ei needs to be not equal. Or we can do it like that on the template itself, or we can do it like I did before, inside the type from the template itself. You're saying BI is just a type name, but EI must be not equal with BI. Okay. So for function, you have a choice. You can use auto without template and Because auto, what auto does behind the scenes, all it does it's, uh, is creating a generic function for you. Instead of you writing all that code by yourself, Auto will create a template for you in the compiler, and it will do all the heavy lifting for you. But still, it's a little bit problematic. So if you want something that, uh, as I have here um, in this function, we have two autos. So for example, I, I, if I wouldn't write here not equal decal type bi auto ei, and I would just write auto, then this will not be heterogeneous at all. It will be homogeneous, uh, sorry, it will be heterogeneous. BI could be anything, EI could be anything. Here I'm constraining the auto to be something I want. So another thing that, uh, that you need to remember with auto concept is that if you want two things to be the same, you must have a concept because they cannot be the same. Auto just said it can be anything. So you need to constrain the auto to do whatever you want it to do. With concepts, yes. What do, what do you usually do for class? Class, uh, uh, you can't use auto, auto, auto. So you 
auto in, in class templates? Uh, no, but you can use auto if you want it inside the constructor. So you can use auto there. It depends on what you want to do. If you want to uh, template a class, you need to give a template specialization for it. Sorry, the template declaration for it, normal template declaration. But this declaration can have as many templates as you want, and it can have co concepts as well. So you can co uh, constrain the type of your template classes as well. It's the same thing. I decided to work with functions because it's easier to explain and it has more things to show. Qu more questions? Yes. Yes. GCC gives nice messages as well. If, uh, since uh, concepts were created, one of the things that, uh, that the creators wanted to do is to make messaging nicer. So GCC is known for its horrible messaging. It's much worse. It's always was worse than Clang. But I cannot say that any, anymore, even now, even without concepts, they got much better. I think it's worth m explaining why the error messages with templates are so horrible. <laughs> well, whenever you are trying to instantiate a type and you cannot find whatever caused uh, the template uh, to not um, deduce, to, to create the type deduction as it wanted it, it, it doesn't understand where exactly it happens. It can, it can just say, okay, it happened here. And as, as, as your templates or as your uh, concepts got uh, when they get this deep, it's a template inside a template inside a template inside a template. So you need to deduce something that is really, really deep inside the template. So it's just saying, I don't know what happened here. When I called this thing, and I don't understand what happened there because I called that. And it just prints out everything, every trace that happened to it. And then you get long, long, long messages. Uh, would you like to elaborate? Basically, um, template resolution is difficult. When it goes wrong, the compiler needs to tell you what went wrong, and it's complicated. <laughs> so there are That's basic, yeah. <laughs> yes? Uh, concepts, no, but you can create a concept. You have to understand that concept is like a regular type. So you're creating a concept, and then you're using it in the variadic form. So it's still the same. You're just saying, for example, Slava D is a, is a concept that you created, and then you will say type name, ellipsis, Slava D. So it will, uh, this template will only accept Slava Ds. Yes? Template don't, uh, sorry, so the question was, it, does it do something uh, to, in the runtime or is it just in compile time? So it's just for compile time. What it does is just checking your types and it's seeing if, it's, if the type is constrained correctly in the compile time. We don't want to get to runtime. That's for C, that's not for us. We want compile time. Anything else? No, thank you. Visit my LinkedIn page.